Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, if you've noticed that family favorites like Pab's Death, the delicious golden cheese food, are sometimes missing from your dealer's shelves, Remember, there's a very good reason. Literally millions of pounds of dairy foods are being shipped abroad to help supply energy and the important milk nutrients our fighting men need. But dealers will usually have Pabstet in stock. And smart homemakers have learned what a wonderful extender it is for a host of wartime foods. Melted into a smooth cheese sauce, the grand cheddar cheese flavor of Pabstet gives real personality to leftovers of meat and fish and vegetables fixed in dozens of different ways. Pabstead is a tasty filling for the children's sandwiches, too, and it slices perfectly for serving with dessert or just by itself. Yes, for a delicious, nourishing, and economical help in preparing meals that'll give family appetites a real lift, ask your dealer for Pabstead in the round, flat package, spelled P-A-B-S-T-E-T-T. Pabstead, only three red ration points for a generous package. weekend, and Saturday afternoon finds Gildersleeve out in the side lot surveying his victory garden and wondering whether to pull the weeds now or let them grow a little bigger so they'll be easier to get hold of. It looks as if they grow a little bigger, for from the window of the kitchen nearby comes the smell of good things in the oven. Let's follow him in and see what's cooking. E five full thumb. I smell something good. What's pretty making there, Marjorie? Frosting for the Easter cake. Frosting? Yes, sir, and I guess it's about done. Uh, Bertie, uh, 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 uh. Mr. Gill, please. You aren't going to put that delicious egg beater in the sink. Oh, no, sir. I'm saving it for Leroy. Leroy can lick the bowl. Give it here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Uncle Mort, you're looking cross-eyed. I don't want to miss any of it. <laughs> Kitchen door. Uh, I'll go, Bertie. So wipe off your chin. Yeah. Gildersleeve? Yes? Express, sign here. Wait a minute, what is it? Crate, sign here. I didn't order any crate. Name Gildersleeve? Yes? Sign here. Yes. <laughs> well, hold the egg beater and hold it, too. I don't know what I'm signing this for. Yeah, there. All right, one side, bud. Wait a minute. One side, We one don't si- want that great big thing here in the kitchen. Well, where do you want it? Make up your mind. I haven't got all day. Listen, I've got a good mind to report you to your superior. Brother, in two hours, I report to my draft board. <laughs> now, where do you want it? Yeah, all right. Set it right down here. So is your place. Hey! Yeah, careful! Don't you know we got a cake in the oven? <laughs> That's the kind of service you get these days. What do you suppose is in the crate, Uncle Moore? I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Uh, Bertie, do you know where the hammer is? Right there in the vegetable bin, Miss Gill, please. Oh, just the place for it, too. Well, <laughs> uh, let's see now. Careful, Uncle Mort. It might be something breakable. Uh, maybe I can pry the top up. Hey, Uncle, that's the express man. Uh-huh. Yeah, and now it's coming. Uncle, wait a minute. Yes, there. Look out! Oh! Oh, my goodness, rabbit! Rabbit! Never get them. They're under the refrigerator. Maybe we have some food we could get them to come out. Yeah, try some popsies. Rabbits don't eat popsies. I don't know, my dear. Popsies always tasted like rabbit food to me. <laughs> well, I could poke under there with a the broom, maybe. Oh, no, you might hurt them. Those are very valuable rabbits. They cost me over two bucks. Remind me to ask you, Leroy, where you got the two bucks. Here, bunny, here, bunny, here, bunny, here, bunny. No, oh, no, you'll never get them that way. Don't you have to get down on your hands and knees? And they can just stay under there. <laughs> We've got to get them out. They might get stuck under there. Those are Flemish giants. They grow fast. Yes. All right. It'll teach them a lesson, then. Oh, there he goes. I got him. I got one of them. Oh, no. 
Isn't he darling? Bring him over here, Leroy. Let me see. Oh, he's frightened. Look, he's shivering. Let me hold him, Leroy. No, let me hold him. Sure, I'm here. Don't let him get away. That's a valuable rabbit. Oh, isn't he cunning? <laughs> uh, feel him, Marjorie. Feel how soft he is. Ah. Oh. Uh. <laughs> There, there, little bunny. Now, don't you be frightened. Look, Marjorie, look how he wrinkles up his little nose. Would you, would you, would you, would you, would you? <laughs> Uncle Mort, you're doing it, too. I can't help it. He's making faces at me, the little rat. <laughs> you like him, Uncle? Oh, he's as cute as the Dickens, Leroy. How did you get him? Well, from an ad in Wonder Man Comics. Huh? I sent for them only 217 express prepaid. Where did you get the 217? Oh, I got it. It's a great investment, Uncle. It says in the ad. Boys, make big money raising rabbits. Yes. Well, I wouldn't count on it, my boy. As pets, rabbits may be fine, but... Don't say anything about pets. I'm raising these rabbits to eat. To eat? Eat a little fuzzy, cunning, helpless little thing like that? Leroy, I think you're horrible. Marjorie, take this rabbit and put him somewhere. I want to get to the bottom of this. I got the other one, Miss Gilfrey. Well, give him to Marjorie, Bertie. There. Now, Flopsy and Monk. Come on, we'll find a nice, safe, warm place for you, away from that awful leaf ball. Yes. Now, young man, why was I not consulted before you bought those rabbits? Well, I, I wanted to surprise you, Uncle, for Easter. You surprised me, all right. Where'd you get the money? All of it. You, of course. All of it. Well, uh, the 17 cents I had. <laughs> all right, but what about the two dollars? Well, uh... You know those old, rusty, no-good old roller skates I got Christmas before last? They were very excellent skates when I gave them to you. I thought Santa Claus gave them to me. Uh, uh, we won't argue about that, young man. <laughs> All right. Anyway, they were always getting in your way, and anyway, I outgrew them, and anyway, one wheel was busted, so I traded them with Piggy. Did you tell him the wheel was busted, uh, broken? Well, he doesn't need all the wheels. He just wants to make a push wheel. Nevertheless, that was not a very honest thing to do, Leroy, was it? Well, he swapped it for a spark coil that wouldn't spark. I'm glad to hear you didn't get the best of it. Now, stop beating around the bush and tell me, where did you get those two dollars? Well, you know, the spark coil. You just told me about it. It wouldn't spark. Yeah, so I traded it. Who'd you trade it to? Michael. Mrs. Ransom's little niece? I mean, nephew? Well, he wanted it. Uncle kept pestering me for it. Did you tell him it wouldn't work? Did you? Well, gosh, Unc, you wouldn't want me to give him a spark coil that works. They're dangerous. He might get a shock. He might get a shock. <laughs> All right, you charlatan. What did you trade the spark coil for? Come on, what did you trade it for? Two bucks. That's what we call selling, Leroy, not trading. And you sold that spark coil under false pretenses, with deliberate intent to defraud. Oh, no, I didn't, Unc, honest. Then what was your intention? To get the two bucks. <laughs> Leroy, I honestly believe you don't know the simple difference between right and wrong. Yeah, that's all it is, Unc. I don't know any better. Gosh, if I knew it. That's better... enough, Leroy. <laughs> Go help Marjorie find a place for those rabbits. And see that it's not in my study. I'll take this thing up with you later. Yeah, sure, I will. I'll find a good place for them. Uh, Bertie, I don't know what I'm going to do about that boy. I swear I don't. Oh, now, Leroy ain't a bad boy, Mr. Gillsleeve. He's just a boy, that's all. Well, he needs something. I don't know what, though. Well, if you ask me, Mr. Gillsleeve, what Leroy needs is a mother. Yes, I'm afraid you're right, Bertie. There's not much I can do about that. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you're young, Mr. Gillsleeve. You got your health. You even got a fiancé. And if you don't mind me asking, uh, what are you waiting for? By George, Bertie, that's what I'm going to ask her. And I'm going to ask her right now, too. Who's there? The Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't have said that. i got to be tough with her. This time, by George, she's going to give me an answer. I'm not like some people. You can twist them around your little finger. When I... Leela, when are we going to get married? Uh, what did you say? You heard me. Oh, gracious, Rock Martin, you're so impetuous. Impetuous? We've been engaged now for four months. What's so impetuous about that? I want to know when we're going to get married. Well, come in, won't you? No, you come out. <laughs> 
Very well, Throckmorton, if you wish. Yes. Now, I'm going to sit down here on the veranda and settle this once and for all. Yes, let's. You know, Throckmorton, you are so masterful. I hardly know you when you're like this. Well, it's my other side. <laughs> now, let's get down to business. When do we get married? Name the date, Leila. Well, tell me first. Why do you want me to marry you, Throckmorton? Well, because... Uh, well, just because. Uh, because what? Because I... Go on, say it. Because you what? Well, I think Leroy needs a mother. A mother? Is that all I am to you? A mother for Leroy? Now, Leela, I didn't say that. Well, I guess I know what you were thinking, and I can give you your answer right now. Now, Leela, don't fly off the handle. Let's be reasonable about this thing. Doc Martin, I am the soul of reason, I assure you. I've thought it all over, and I've decided that we have no business getting married till after the war. After the war? But, Leela, that may be a long time. Well, you ask me for my decision, and that's it. I'll marry you the day the war is won. That settles it. What? I demand a second front. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to interrupt here for just a moment in order to present a very charming and courageous lady who has something to say to you. That she is charming is no secret to her thousands of admirers, and the proof of her courage is her four-month expedition across the Atlantic this past winter to entertain our troops in England, Ireland, Scotland, and North Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kay Francis. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask your attention for one minute. One minute isn't very long, but in this very brief minute that you hear my voice, men are dying for you, dying on distant battlefields, in strange waters. Men from Nebraska, Illinois, Texas, boys from across the street, boys that you know. Right now, while I speak to you, 60 seconds in a minute, how many times 60 men are dying for you? And as they die, they are remembering home, remembering us, wanting to come home, knowing they never will. Are we worth remembering? Are we worth coming home to? No. Not unless we do all we possibly can to win this war. And our possible all is so little compared to what they give. We are not asked to give, but to lend our dollars to our government, to carry our share of the $13 billion needed in the second war loan. Lend your dollars right now, right this minute, while those men are giving their lives for you. You'll get your dollars back. Thank you, Miss Francis. Now let's get back to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. It's Easter morning, and the great man has started the day in a constructive and beneficent mood. He's intending, before donning his finery for the Easter parade, to build a rabbit hutch, but a brief inspection of the garage shows him that something is missing, namely the rabbits. Leroy, where are your little pets? You mean Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit? Yes, you don't have to be so formal either. Oh, well, they're in a perfectly safe place, Unc. Where are they? Don't worry about them. Oh, Leroy! What is it, Bertie? Did you put those rabbits in the fireplace? Fireplace? There's no fire in it. Yep. That's their new home, Bertie. They love it there. Well, maybe so, but they've moved out. It's... What? They did. Young man, you'll have to find those rabbits before we go to church. So get busy. Oh, gosh, Unc, won't you help? Well, that depends. If I... Hey, here comes Judge Hooker over by the back fence. Judge Hooker, huh? What's he doing around here? Gildersleeve. Oh, Gildersleeve. Just stay on the other side of that fence, Hooker. You owe me a fender. You owe me a bumper. Uh-huh. You happen to be the owner of two oversized, overage gray rabbits? Oh, my goodness. Go get them, Leroy. Those rabbits belong to my nephew, Judge Hooker. See that you don't do anything that injures them. Injures them? Look here, I just caught him finishing up the last set of lettuce in my victory garden. <laughs> I'm beginning to like those rabbits. <laughs> well, if I catch him over here again, I'll give him to the city pound. Here, take him, Leroy. Thanks. So 
So just remember, Gildersleeve, you not only owe me a bumper, but you owe me one dozen heads of lettuce. You owe me a fender, and you can take a dozen heads of lettuce from my victory garden. <laughs> what are you laughing at, you old nanny goat? The rabbits ate your lettuce first. Oh! <laughs> Now, let's see. Handkerchief for the breast pocket. Need a flower for my buttonhole. Better put on the silk hat just to see how the whole thing looks. There. Ooh. Hi, <laughs> George Gildersleeve. You're a handsome fellow in a cutaway. Yes, sir. Uh, come in. Sam, come on down. Mrs. Ransom is here, and Marjorie wants to take everybody's picture. Oh, good idea. I'll come right now. Leroy, I wonder if you could find me a flower somewhere for my buttonhole. Okay, what do you want, an Easter lily? No. Leroy, just something small and suitable. Oh, hello, Leela. Mm-hmm. Oh, happy Easter. Well, happy Easter to you, too, Trockmont. Oh, that's a beautiful costume, my dear. Everyone will be saying, lucky Gildersleeve. Oh, now, Trockmorton. But you look simply angelic in your gray trousers and cutaway, doesn't he, Marjorie? Oh, he always does. He looks all ready for a wedding. Let's not go into that. <laughs> Come on outdoors, everybody, and we'll take your picture. Ben's got the camera out there. Well, are you sure there's time, Marjorie? Your uncle and I are going to check. Oh, we all are. Of course, Leela. Come on. Well, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Happy Easter. Oh, thanks, my boy. The same to you, Ben. Now, uh, where do you want us to stand? Oh, right there inside the lilac. Be all right. Oh, fine. I'll put some lilac in my buttonhole. Just stand anywhere, really. Uh, isn't too much trouble. Now, if you could just smile, please. How's this? I oh, gotcha. <laughs> that one ought to be fine. Now, who's going to take our picture? I'll do it, Marge. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, I take better pictures than anyone in the family. He has been lucky. All right, Leroy. Uh, where shall I stand, Marge? Well, right beside me. Here? Well, that's where I am already. <laughs> Can't you get a little closer? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> All right, now look at her, you big goof. <laughs> well, I am looking at her. Uh, ben, honey, why don't you put your arm around her waist? Oh, gosh, right here in front of everybody? <laughs> Why not? Well, all right. Say, this is quite comfortable. <laughs> well, oh, oh, Throckmorton, they're so in love. Don't they look beautiful together? Yes, they do, Leela. They just look like an Easter magazine cover, I decline. Yes, so do you, Leela. Got it! Thank you, Leroy. Yeah, I'm much obliged. Gee, I never enjoyed having my picture taken before. <laughs> By George, I'm glad we decided to walk, Leela. Mm, it is nice. Yes, sir. Oh, good morning, Dr. Pettibone. Happy Easter. Good morning, Doctor. He goes to a different church. Mm, I know. Here comes old Mrs. Carrington. Don't tell me she's walking to church. Yeah, but you stop for a long conversation. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Carrington. Oh, happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Happy Easter, Mrs. Carrington, and what a lovely shawl you're wearing. Thank you, Mrs. Ransom. I'm glad you had the sense not to call it a fascinator. Yeah, you're, uh, you're looking awfully well, Mrs. Carrington. <laughs> Did you have a good winter? Pretty cold, pretty cold. Uh, yes, but now it's spring. <laughs> uh, what do you hear from your grandson? Is he still with the... Uh, uh, uh... Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, uh... Uh, they made him a vice president this year, and next year they're going to raise a salary. Uh, well... <laughs> well, he's coming along nicely. <laughs> uh, oh, 
Mercy, I'm afraid we'll all be late for church. Oh, we must all hurry, but I'm glad to see you young people still dress up for Easter. You'll make a very handsome couple. Well. Oh, now, Mrs. Carrington. I haven't had a chance to congratulate you formally. Uh, when is the wedding to be? Well, it depends a little on the war. Oh, don't wait too long. Uh. After all, we're only young ones. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. Goodbye, Mr. Gilderson. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Carrington. <laughs> oh, she's a wonderful old lady. I always enjoy seeing her. She makes me feel so young. Yeah. Come on, Trotmore. Let's run. Run? Uh, Leela? Hey, wait. <laughs> nothing like the feeling when you've been to church on Easter. Plus, I always feel like a new man after church, but on Easter, I feel even happier. Mm, I feel the same way, Throckmorton. I don't know what it is, the Easter hymns or something. But when the collection basket came around this morning, I put in twice as much as I'd planned. Oh, really? Yeah, should have planned that much in the first place, though. Oh, here comes Peavy. Uh, happy Easter, Peavy. Happy Easter, Mr. Peavy. Yeah, well, joyous Easter to you, Mrs. Ransom, and to you too, Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> Just uh, coming from church, Mr. Peavy? Yes, I am, Mrs. Ransom. Mrs. Peavy and I attended the services together, and then I went by the shop to get this little surprise for it. Uh, surprise, eh? What is it, a plant? A begonia. I've given her a potted begonia every Easter since we've been married. Uh, listen, Peavy, if you've given her a begonia every Easter, she couldn't possibly be surprised when you walk in with this one. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you've already given her 20 or 30 begonias for Easter. 31. I know, because Mrs. Peavy saves the pots. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Yes, and when I give her this one, I know... Just exactly what she'll say. What, Mr. Peavy? <laughs> she'll say, Richard Peavy, don't you know it's wicked to be extravagant? But that's not extravagant, Richard. Well, I know that, Mr. Gillespie. So does Mrs. Peavy. That's just her little way of acting surprised. <laughs> I think it's a very sweet way, too. I do myself. Anyhow, she always says it, and then she gives me my surprise. Uh, you get a surprise, too. Huh? What's your surprise, Peavy? A box of crystallized ginger. You Crystallized. <laughs> Crystallized ginger? That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Yes, but I've got a taste for it. Yes. <laughs> and is that your surprise every year, Mr. Peavy? Every year. It's a wonder you don't faint from excitement. <laughs> well, I don't faint, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I give a pretty good imitation. Yeah, good enough to fool Mrs. Peavy. Well, I wouldn't say that. Yes. <laughs> but when you folks have been married as long as I have, you... You know that our kind of surprise is more fun than a real one. Yes, you may be right. Well, so long, Peavy. Happy Easter to you and Mrs. Peavy. Well, the same to you and Mrs. Uh, uh, Ransom. Good day. Throckmorton? Yes, Leela? Was there uh, any war news today? Huh? Uh, well, apparently the Allied forces made substantial gains in El Milang region. Mm. Throckmorton? Yes, Leela? Isn't it wonderful that Mr. and Mrs. Peavy are so happy after all these years? Yeah, I guess so. Of course, he's rather a strange fellow. Uh, uh, Throckmorton? Yes? We're uh, neither of us getting any younger, are we? Of course not, Leela. Uh, Throckmorton? What is it, Leela? How would you like to come to my house this evening for chicken fricassee? There'll just be the two of us. Chicken fricassee? Oh, brother, I'll be there. <laughs> that was a wonderful dinner, Leela. I'm glad you liked it, darling. Maybe I overindulged a little. Oh, I didn't notice. That's because I didn't overindulge any more than usual. <laughs> <laughs> You were so cute sitting at the head of my table serving my dinner and all. It looked natural somehow. Mm -hmm. Guess I'll smoke a cigar. Uh, you know something, Throckmorton? I've been nervous in this house the last few days. What on earth is there to be nervous about? Oh, nothing in particular. 
sometimes I think I hear strange noises in the night. But, you know, with you here, I don't feel nervous a bit. Fine, fine, fine. But when you're not here, I do feel nervous. And maybe you ought to see Dr. Pettibone. Get some vitamins. Oh, fish. What did you say, Leela? Nothing. Rock Martin, I've been thinking. Yes, Leela? Maybe Leroy shouldn't wait till after the war to have a mother. Oh. Huh? <laughs> Leela, will you? What do you mean, Rock Martin? Could you marry me before the war is over? Well, for Leroy's sake, I might consider it. How about next week? Now, Rock Martin, don't be so impetuous. Well, June's a nice month for wedding. Yes, it is. June 1st. Well, that's awfully soon. June 1st. Well, I think we might say the first week in June. Oh, uh, darling, you know, this is the happiest Easter of my life. Really? Really, honey? Sure. Why, everybody ought to be married. It's a law of nature. Two by two. Male and female. A girl for every boy in the world. Hey, now, what do you think? Leroy, what? Mr. and Mrs. Roberts just had quintuplets. Hmm. <laughs> Easter, like all important holidays, is a time for families and old friends to get together, or if they can't do that, at least to get in touch with one another. And so this Easter, we of the Kraft family bring you the greetings of our sponsor through its president, Mr. J.L. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. I'm glad of this opportunity to bring Easter greetings to Kraft men and women everywhere and to the families of our boys and girls who are now in the service of their country. When we think of Easter, we naturally think of the resurrection. The two words are eternally linked together. In every Christian land today, the celebration of Easter will bring its age-old message of hope to a war-darkened world. The fact of the resurrection and the faith which it symbolizes have never been so significant to so many nations and to so many peoples in the world's history. In itself, the word resurrection is one of the most beautiful in our language. It means bringing back to life the conquest of death, the return of hope. At this springtime of the year, all nature tells the story of resurrection. We read its meaning in the budding trees and in the miracle of nature's reawakening to vibrant life. There is still another significance to the word resurrection, to bring back to memory that which was forgotten or lost. And it is upon this meaning of resurrection that I have been reflecting on this Easter Sunday. While our boys are away fighting for freedom around the world, enduring hardships, loneliness, weariness, we on the home front have a high responsibility toward them. While they are absent, our virtues grow in their minds and our shortcomings are forgotten. Let us so live our lives that their ideals will not be shattered when they return. Let us make them as proud of us as we are proud of them. And so it seems particularly fitting to me that each of us at this Easter time should resurrect and strengthen our faith in God and in the ideals of our forefathers. That faith and those ideals on which this nation was founded and by which it grew strong and great. As youngsters, our mothers taught us to say when we pray, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. I have just had a letter from one of our own boys in North Africa in which he says that eight men of his group kneel at their bunks every night and speak this prayer as they go to sleep. It means something to them. It meant something to us as children. Let us then, as we think of these simple prayers, resurrect the trusting faith of our childhood and approach God understandingly. Let us resurrect and renew our strength in the God-given pioneer virtues. Let us at home in our daily lives have the courage, the strength, and the fortitude of those who fight for freedom, that we and our children and they and their children may live in peace. They are counting on us, depending on us, to maintain their ideals of home and family until they join us again. And in this we cannot fail them.
program has come to you from Chicago and Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.